Hello once again and welcome to the Amalgamated with Christ Church where the purpose statement is the same to bring people back into fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. It's raining and it's raining pretty hard but nevertheless we're still here and we're going to give God thanks and we're going to worship Him because though it's raining, though it's dark, though it's gloomy, though it's bleaky, we're sheltered and that is just the way it is. God will shelter us from sin. But there is a thing that can prevent us from accessing that shelter and that is spiritual deformity. So this morning, the focus scripture is John 5, and we look at verses 1 to 15. And we want to talk about spiritual deformity. That's one of the hindrances that's hindering many of us from fellowshipping with God. Today, many people, many people are adherent churchgoers. Meaning they are zealous, they have a passion, they are committed, and they are oftentimes rather stern in terms of how they approach certain things or certain one or certain things that they do not think line up with the word or towards church. Nevertheless, Many, though they have this zeal, though they have this passion, though they have this sense of purpose, there is still a speck of active sin that's lying within their lives. And I dare to say, there is still a speck of active sin that may be lying in our lives. So, we may be in the right place at the right time, listening to the right person, saying the right words and it's still not impactful on our life that is because there is that speck of sin that leads to spiritual deformity which is separating us from God how could this be it is simple with spiritual deformity everything around us looks normal Everything around us is accepted within society because it has become the norm because there is a separation from God. And if you have sin in your life, you will not be able to fulfill that purpose that you were designed to do, which is to glorify God. And so the scripture says in Galatians 5 and 17, it says, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Are these things are contrary to one another. What do I mean? You want to do what you want to do, the flesh. But the spirit of God, the spirit of God which is to remind us about the teaching of Jesus Christ and to direct our part is in conflict with your flesh nature and because there is that separation what you find is that you have no allegiance to God and so the Holy Spirit cannot get to work within you and so there goes that thing that's called spiritual deformity that's within your life and so when sin causes us to miss God's purpose when sin causes us to not do the things that we ought to do if we are believers or if we are followers of Christ. That is essentially what spiritual deformity is all about. And when there is spiritual deformity, you essentially give over your life to the authority of Satan. Now the good news is that though there is spiritual deformity, through Jesus Christ, that little illness, that little speck, it can be cured. And so we go to the scriptures. Because spiritual deformity is a serious thing. It's alive and it's well today. 
But many people, as I said, because they do not have that relationship with God through Jesus Christ, they cannot identify spiritual deformity. And I say to you, Jesus Christ is the cure. Listen to 1 John 5 and verse 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And if you read on to 5, who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. I said Jesus Christ is the cure for spiritual deformity. But there must be a rebirth. There must be a renewed mind. You may be in the right church. You may be at the right time listening to the right messages and doing everything that you term or you believe is right within your sight. But guess what? There is spiritual deformity because you're not being led by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit must be alive and well within you for you to realize the blessings of God. So the right church, the right connections, the right everything means nothing unless there is a rebirth and this rebirth can only come through repentance. So if you look at Acts 2.38, Peter said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Christ for the remissions of your sins. There must be a connection with Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins. And first, there must be repentance. And so if you go back to the focal scripture that we read, which was from John 5, and you look at verses 1 to 2, Verses 1 to 2 describe the place where this lame man was who was deformed. It said there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, that's the first place. A very religious place, a place that's even revered today. Jerusalem, this man was in Jerusalem. He was in a very religious place. Now, verse 2. Now, there is a, in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool. He was next to the sheep gate. So the man was in Jerusalem. He was located next to the sheep gate. So he was well positioned, just as many of us are today. We are in church. We know of a church. We are well positioned, but we are still deformed. So it does not matter your position. doesn't matter what access you have to a church building, to the pastor, to the preacher. It means nothing if your mind is not renewed. It means nothing if there is no change. There is still spiritual deformity. Now I said this man was well positioned. He was by the sheep gate. And if you read in Nehemiah chapter 3, it sums it up. It tells you that in Jerusalem there were 10 gates. Now the sheep gate, it's interesting that Jesus came through the sheep gate. Because the sheep gate has some spiritual meaning. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who was ultimately killed, ultimately sacrificed for our being, for our, for our sins, so that we can claim this reborn, we can claim this rebirth. So the sheep gate was a gate with, the, the, as it said, the sheep used to come through. And Jesus came through the sheep gate. So this man was well positioned. He was in a religious place. He was well positioned, so he had access to the one that brings salvation. And if you look at today's church, many of us are in a religious organization. We are well positioned, and we have access to the one through the grace of God who brings salvation. But there is still spiritual deformity. And so the scripture further describes the place. It says, having five porches. Look at it in today's, uh, today's principle. Many of us are in beautiful churches, beautiful sanctuaries, all the latest equipment, the latest gadgets, the latest everything, air condition, everything. Rain is falling, it's going crazy outside, but we're here and we're dry and we're comfortable. And so many people today, they're in a very nice place, but there is still spiritual deformity within their lives. They're in a place where there is great crescendo. They're in a place where there is smoke screen. They're in a place where there are, there are, there are, are gadgets galore. They're in a place where, where the pastor, the pastor of things surrounding him to bring and deliver the word. But there is still spiritual deformity. Why is that? Is it that many people are just gathered for a show? Is it that all that set up is just for a show? 
Is it that there is no meaning, nothing representing God? Is it that, is it that we, are just, we are just pretending? Is it that sin has got such a hold of us that we are spiritually deformed without knowing it? Meaning we're walking crooked when we should be upright, but we do not know it because we are yet to be delivered from sin. So we are fooling ourselves. Go on, John 2 and Luke 3. It says when Jesus came through, right, there were multiple, there lay great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the waters. Many people are in the right place, the right time, and there's all sorts of spiritual disease. They're spiritually blind. They can't see what's happening. They're spiritually deaf. They're not hearing what is happening. They're spiritually lame. They're not moving towards the right thing. They do not have the right intention. So they all, there is moving of the Holy Spirit within. They are too caught up doing what they're doing. Because you may be in church and miss everything. Because all you do when you're in church, you're still on your cell phone. You're still on the internet. Nevertheless, the scripture tells you that when you're in the house of the Lord, you have to keep your foot. They're still gossiping, whispering in here, talking about the latest thing. Nevertheless, when you should be focused. And so you miss the moving of the Holy Spirit because of spiritual deformity. And so today, many of us, again I say, we're in a very religious place. We have a very religious mindset. But we are unable to access the moving of the Holy Spirit due to spiritual deformity. And so ultimately, we are paralyzed by this. And so we are overcome by the things of the world. When scripture clearly tells us in Galatians 5, 16 that we should walk in the spirit so we do not fulfill the desires of the flesh. But if you cannot see and you cannot hear and the Holy Spirit does not have access to you because you have blocked him out, you will not be led by the Holy Spirit. And so your deformity will continue. It will continue. And so you are contaminated. And when you are contaminated, the Holy Spirit cannot dwell in anything that is dirty. Doesn't matter how you may cry out. Doesn't matter how you may travail. Unless there is true repentance, the Holy Spirit will be absent from you. Because the Holy Spirit must have access to something that is clean and pure. What do you mean? Listen to the scriptures, Isaiah 59, and look at verse um, 2. But your iniquities have separated you from God. You may be in church. But your iniquities have separated you from God. And your sins have hidden his face from you. You may be in church. And he cannot see your face because your sins is too ugly to look at. Dirty. You may cry out. But your sin may cause him not to hear you. The scripture said that. Now let's put it together. Isaiah 59 2. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. You see, it is your God. So you should have a personal relationship with him. And your sins have hidden his face from you. So that he will not hear you. God requires for us to be righteous, for us to be holy. God is not into the playing. It does not matter if you're in the right place. Listen to the right words. If you're rightly positioned. If the place that you're in is, is very beautiful. It have everything. The preacher may have all the letters behind his name. All the accolades. But it means nothing because your iniquities have separated you from God. And so the man and woman with spiritual deformity, they need to come to sense and come into repentance. Because Isaiah 45 and 22, it says, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. So you may be in church and you're looking towards a preacher to deliver you. But who should you look to? Scripture says, look to me, capital M, which is God, and be saved. All you ends of the earth, everyone, everyone. Some people do not want to go to church unless a certain man is bringing the word. It's not the man you're going to. You're going to hear from God. 
Some people will move away from the church because the man that is delivering the word has fell from grace. That means you did not have any allegiance to the church. You had allegiance to the man. And so, a lot of times it bothers me to see when people are following a man instead of following the church. It bothers me when people are following the man and not following the church. Because the moment that man who is simply flesh, the moment that man who still has the DNA of sin with him, the moment that man, God forbids, if he slips up, then everybody is dispersed. And so the church dissolved. And so people on the outside looking in keep saying, you see what I tell you? But they were following the man and not the church. They were not in it for the word of God. They were in it because they were drawn to the person that was presenting the word. They were not drawn to the word of God. And that, my dear friends, is spiritual deformity. And so I said once again, the man and woman who is seeking to be freed of spiritual deformity must have repentance. The scripture says, look to me and be saved all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no water. The very presence of sin in our lives will lead to the wrath of God. You're saying you don't believe it. That's your business if you don't want to believe it. That's your business. That's your business. You don't have to believe it. You see, people don't believe a lot of things. But whether or not you believe it, it's true. Because truth is exclusive to God. Romans 1 and verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So it does not matter if you want to believe it or not. If you don't believe it, it's because of spiritual deformity. So if you do not want to and you keep doing what you're doing, you have been warned. The wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And so the very presence of sin in your life will lead to the wrath of God. And if you read Romans chapter 1, it details some of the things and one very profound portion of scripture in Romans 1 is verse 24 where it says therefore God also gave them over up to uncleanness in the lust of their heart to dishonor <clears throat> their bodies among themselves so you don't have to believe it it's playing out before our very own eyes today Man and woman decided they do not believe it and they're doing what they see fit. But what does God say? What does God say? What is it that God requires of us? Go back to John. <clears throat> Go back to John. You look at John because this is a very serious thing. Spiritual deformity. John 5 and look at 4. Listen. For an angel went down at a certain time in the pool and stirred up the water. And whosoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. You see, even though you are in church, if you do not have the right mindset, you will not be able to see when the Holy Spirit is moving. And because you have no relationship with the Holy Spirit and you cannot discern the spiritual things, then you will miss out on what God has in store for you. Some of you are entangled, you're entrenched in generational curses, but you're too busy, so you cannot see, and you are not being led by the Holy Spirit, so you cannot break the curse. The Holy Spirit must be present in any church that you go to. It must be present, but due to spiritual deformity, the Holy Spirit is not present in many churches. The Holy Spirit is being replaced by technology. The Holy Spirit has been replaced by smoke screens. The Holy Spirit has been replaced by great crescendo. The Holy Spirit has been replaced by sound effect. The Holy Spirit has been replaced by theatrics. Everything to pull your mind away because whoever is delivering the word to you themselves, they may be spiritually deformed. And if they are spiritually deformed, they cannot articulate, thus say the Lord. And so, 
Spiritual deformity continues. It continues. It continues. It continues. And the more it continues, is the more you're spiritually deformed. And so therefore, the more you are deformed, is the more you are being burdened by sin. And the more you are being burdened, is the more crooked you have become. And when it's time for you to be strained out, it's very hard, it's very difficult. Do you know, or haven't you not seen, people who are supposed to be in church are people who have neglected God when they are presented with the truth. Do you see how difficult it is for them to accept it? Do you see the amount of excuse they put up? They find every excuse in the book. I don't believe in this thing. I don't believe in this God. So I said, what is the alternative? Tell me what you have to offer me that is better than what God has to offer. Because as far as I'm concerned, in the world out there, it's every man for himself. Because if you really look in the grand scheme of things, it's whatever I can do to get by. But when you are in fellowship with God through Jesus Christ, it's come what may, he will take care of you. It doesn't matter what your relationship with, with, the, with, with the man in the pulpit is. If you, are, if, you, if you are qualified, you are qualified. It doesn't matter who you know in society. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Because money cannot buy into the things of God. And so the scripture says, believer in Christ should not show favoritism. But we see it happening in church today. And so, therefore, it continues right here. Now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years, meaning he had a problem for 38 years. He had a problem for 38 years. He had a problem for 38 years. And the problem was that he was a cripple. He had spiritual deformity. How do you know? I'm not making this thing up. I'm not making this thing up. You go down and you read and it says right here, the man was lying on a bed. And Jesus said to him, take up your mat and walk. Take up your mat and walk. So he was lame because he was laying on the, mat, on the bed. And he could not get up and move when the water was stirring. Some of us are infirm for a very long time. And though Jesus has sent the word of repentance to you via the preacher, via the scriptures, you still have not accepted it because you're so deformed, you're so burdened by sin that you cannot see, you cannot ascertain what is right. And so, spiritual deformity continues to blossom in your life. Yes, it blossom. Because when things blossom, it continues to bear fruit. And so many of us, instead of having the fruits of the Spirit, we have fruits of sin being blossomed in our lives. And so, I want to show you something. When there is spiritual deformity, a lot of things happen. And one of the things that happens, you become a fool to the things of God. As because you're a fool to the things of God, Psalm 53, summed it up best in verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Listen, they are corrupt and have done abominable iniquity and there is none who does good you see when you're spiritually deformed you have to be careful you have to be careful because it's just by the mercies by the grace of God that you are still surviving and so I said when you have been burdened by sin and you have access to Jesus Christ this is what you should do once you have access to him the scripture says in Psalm 55 verse 22 cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you he shall never permit the righteous to be moved yeah so you may be infirm for a very long time sin may have caused some stuff to grow in your life and though you have accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but because of your past deeds, you are still afflicted. For example, if you are alcoholic, drinking yourself to death and you have the cirrhosis of the liver, and you're in end-stage liver failure, 
and you're not qualified for a liver transplant or where you're located, you cannot get a liver transplant, guess what? You're still going to die from cirrhosis of the liver because of the consequences, because of your action. But guess what? You can be comforted knowing that you are fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. I don't know how many of you have been around someone that is dying, but many times a man or woman that is dying, they, once they have a relationship with God, look at them, look at them, look at the, the peace that, the, that is on their face. Look at the peace that is surrounding them. You see, you see, the things of God will give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. But when you do not have that peace of God due to spiritual deformity, then you keep worrying day and night. Then you keep worrying day and night. So the scripture says once again, to cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. Because if you don't, do not cast your burden on the Lord, then you're going to suffer further deformity from the sin that has been holding you down. Sin will lay me up. Sin will lay me up for a lifetime. Sin will lay me up for generations. Sin will continue within your life and there will be further deformity unless you are willing to break that chain. The shackles of sin must be removed. And sometimes you need a brace. So when you're crooked and we're trying to straighten you up and we put you in a brace, it's uncomfortable. And when you walk and when you sleep and when you move, you're feeling the pain. That is going around or going through you because of corrective measures that are being taken within your life. But there comes a time when you no longer will know that you have that brace on you. And that's what it means when you cast your burden on the Lord and he's sustaining you from everything that is sinful within your life. You see, you can be in church or out of church. But due to your own doing or due to Satan's deceptive tactics, you will never know that you are being led astray. You will never come into repentance because you spend a lot of time quenching the spirit and the scripture tells you that do not quench the spirit. And so though the Holy Spirit is alive and well because you are known by God, but because of your actions of quenching the Holy Spirit, you grieve the Spirit and He moves away from you. You grieve Him and He moves away. And then you move over into a different category. And Romans 6.23 says, For the waging of sin is dead, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, sin is a very dangerous thing and spiritual deformity is no respecter of man. But Jesus Christ is merciful. Look at verse, um, John 5, look at 6. When Jesus saw him lying there, Jesus is seeing us. Jesus knew what he had, that he had already been in that condition. In that condition is in italics. So it's a specific condition. It's pointed out for you to recognize. It's not, it's not just written in the Bible just, just because of a style. It is highlighted so you can recognize it. And that, and, that, and, and, and that condition was that he was lamed up. So you must be willing to change when Jesus show up. Jesus show up and Jesus said to him, Do you want to be made well? The Holy Scripture is speaking Jesus Christ is speaking today, and the question is to you today. Do you want to be free from sin? That's a question, but you have to have an answer. Do you want to be made well? Jesus asked him that question because mercy is still available once you are alive. But if you die in your sins, die in iniquity, you know that the wages of sin is death. So it says Jesus saw and Jesus knew. So when Jesus shows up at your door knocking, do you want to be made well? What is going to be your answer? Give me more time so I can party some more. 
Give me a little bit more time so I can. I will, I will, I will seek you after I, after I conduct this deal. I'll seek, I'll seek you after I move certain amount of keys. I'll seek you after I have done with so many women. I'll seek you after I have so much money in the bank. But your time is different from God's time, you know. And your time may, your, your, your time may be now. Your time may be now. And so the scripture says, look at this, 2 Peter 3 and verse 8. But, beloved, it's a term of endearment, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Your time may be now. Your time may be now. And listen to the scripture speaking. Continue reading. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as one counts slackness. But is long suffering towards us. He's willing to give us a choice, a, 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 a chance. He's patient, right? Right? But not willing that any should perish. God does not want you or me to be to, to perish. But listen to this. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There will come a time when you will be held accountable. There is no repentance in the grave. There will come a time when God will call you up. What have you done? You just see the scripture. You just heard the scripture. God will return. That is true. You're saying, but I've been hearing it and we've been hearing it for thousands of years. Are you just hearing the word? Are you doers of the word? You're saying, I've heard that so many times in my life. It's a good thing you're still alive today. You are going to hear it again. You're going to hear it again and again and again. Because one day when you're dead, you no longer will hear. One day when you're dead, you can no longer repent. Jesus liked this. Jesus liked to say there will be weeping and mourning and gnashing of teeth. Many of us will try and cry out and bawl out, but too late shall be the cry. Too late shall be the cry. You cannot wait for someone and say, I'm waiting for, my, for my, 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 my wife to change. No, you better change. I'm waiting for my man to change. No, you better change. I'm waiting for the pastor to stop stealing. No, you better change. I'm watching the pastor. He's still not ready. No, you better change. Because Revelation 22 and verse 12 says, Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. His reward is with him to give unto everyone. Some translations say man. Everyone. Not to give unto a group of people. Not to give unto the amalgamated with Christ church. Not to give unto so-and-so church. Not to give unto the white church. Not to give unto the black church. Not to give unto that church. But to give unto everyone a reward. What's your reward going to be? What's your reward going to be? When Jesus Christ show up. Go back to John 5 and he said to the man. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? Now this man was, the man is just a yes or no question. We look at verse 7. The man says, sir, I have no one to, to put me into the pool when the water is still. Excuse, 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 excuse. Too often we find excuse, 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 excuse. The question is, do you want Jesus today? Don't give me no excuse. God doesn't want to hear an excuse. He wants to hear, do you want him? Yes or no? It's not no, oh, but. It's no but. It's yes or no. It's not no, let me grab it. No, it's yes or no. It's let me find the right choice. It's yes or no. Do you want to be made well? Do you want repentance? Do you want Jesus Christ today? But although you're fumbling around, Jesus Christ is not ready to ready ready for you yet. God is not ready for you yet. You still have a chance. You still have a chance. Probably someone is travailing in your life. Probably someone has been praying for you and you don't know. So the question is, do you want to be made well? And though you do not know that you want to be made well, your mom could be kneeling on her knees and praying for you. 
But there comes a time when you will realize that it's time for you to get out of your infirmity. And so Jesus said to the man in verse 8, Rise up, take up your bed and walk. Take up your bed, even though you were busy giving excuses. There is still mercy. Take up your bed. There was still mercy. There is still mercy, mercy, mercy. And Psalm 136 verse 1, it says, And his mercy endures forever. And his mercy endure forever. Take up your mat. Take up your mat and walk out of here. Walk out of the condition that has been holding you down all the days of your life. Walk out of generational curses. Walk out of an abusive relationship that is prevent you from serving God. Walk out of a church that is holding you back because all you're preaching is prosperity messages. Walk out of the company that's just full in your head with gossip. Walk out, walk out, walk out if it's not of God. Take up your mat and walk. Even though you are delaying, there is still mercy. Walk away. Now look at this. It's a very interesting story. And I'm looking at it from today's present day principle. Scripture says, John 5, we're sitting in John, look at 9. And immediately, that means without delay, he took up his mat and was made well and he walked away. Now, isn't it interesting? He did not stop and say, thank you Jesus for what you have done. I've been lying down for all these years. Some of us are doing the same thing today. When we receive the healing, when we receive, uh, we receive that break from generational curses, when we get out of an abusive relationship, though you have been lying in it, wallowing it, and you have been relinquished, it has been relinquished, you just move away, not even say, thank you God. And scriptures remind us that in, in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18, that in all things we should give thanks. In all things. And the scripture also says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercies endure forever. But some of us are too busy. We receive the things from God that we've been praying for, and so we forget about God. Because you see, there is still some, some, some sort of a spiritual deformity within us. You've been praying and you've been travailing and you get it. And as soon as you get it, you move away. But all those years when you're lying and wallowing in sin, and you're praying and begging God, if only you do this, I will do this for you. I will come to you. I will. And once God has delivered you, you walk away. I'm not ready. And if you look at John 5, 10 to 13, very interesting, very interesting. Look, the Jews therefore said to him who was cured. It is a Sabbath. You see, the religious people are going to point things out to you. It is a Sabbath. And he answered them. Listen to what he says. He who made me well. He did not know the source. He who made He did not say Jesus made me well. He who made me well. He referred to Jesus as he. Many of us like to, because we like to look cute. We don't want to say Jesus, so we say the man upstairs. We say the big man. We say the one and only. And we give God all sorts of names because we don't want to say God. We will go as far as sometimes to say God, you know. But never Jesus. Oh, me, oh no, don't, don't come to me with a Jesus thing. The big man upstairs has done this for me. I'm going home and I'm going to pray to the man upstairs. When you're on your knees, what do you say? The man upstairs, do this. Which man upstairs? Are you talking to your dad that's sitting upstairs? Are you talking to your father-in-law that's upstairs? Are you talking to your friend that's upstairs? Are you talking to your boss that's upstairs? Are you talking to the true one living God? You have to know who is your source. Know your source. The man upstairs. You will think that after 38 years, after 38 years, it would take time to know who was it that healed him. Who was it that delivered him. It's the same in today's principle. Many of us do not know the source. And so we're easily distracted by gimmicks and religious people. Spend time to learn of the source, to learn about your source. My sheep know my voice, Jesus said. 
Many people are following after someone that is, no, is not a shepherd of God. And so they cannot know or hear the true voice of the one, the Holy One. The person who has fellowship with God through Jesus Christ know him. And he knows them. And that's the reason I like to say, welcome to the amalgamated with Christ church where the purpose statement is to bring people back into fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. It must be amalgamation. And so look at Romans 8 and look at 35. Listen. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? When you have fellowship with God through Jesus Christ, that's where you stand. Because nothing shall separate you. Nothing shall separate you. Go back to John. Very interesting. I was looking at this. I'm like, wow, look at all of this stuff. John 5. Now, verse 14. And afterward, Jesus found in him in the temple. Interesting, you know. He was still wondering. He was lying in that same temple <laughs> for 38 years. Well, you know, he was laying by the pool, but then he moved from the pool and wandered into the temple, right? So he's laying in the vicinity, a very religious place. 38 years. No one helped him. He found excuse, but God is merciful. God helped him through Jesus Christ. Now then, what did he found his place in church? Many people do that, you know. Walk in the church, you know, where there is great crescendo. All dressed up, walking in. Jesus found him in the temple. And you listen to this. When you're reading the Bible, I want you to pay specific attention. Listen. See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. So it's safe to say, sin was the cause of his infirmity. He did not tell you that he was 38 years old, you know. He said he was laid up for 38 years. So chances are he could have been 50. Chances are he could have well been 38. Chances are he could have been 78. We do not know. But it's safe to say from the warning that Jesus gave him. So you may be in church and you still need a warning. So I'm going to say to you this morning, those of you who are in church, still spiritually deformed, say... You have been rescued. God has been merciful to you. Sin no more. See, you have been rescued. Stop sinning. See, you have been rescued because of his mercy. You shall break the chain of spiritual deformity. And so verse 14 just show how merciful God is. Though the man did not say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for deliverance. Jesus still showed up. Because Jesus is watching us. He is everywhere. His word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so he said to him, sin no more. Isn't it strange and isn't it very ironic, the place that he was in when he got the warning? Many of us are getting the warning today in church. We're not getting the warning when we're in the crack house. We're not getting the warning when we're into prostitution. We're not getting the warning when we're into homosexuality. We're not getting the warning when we're committing adultery. We're not getting the warning when we're into fornication. We're not getting the warning when we're killing people. We're not getting the warning when we're lying, stealing, cheating, convicting. We're getting the warning when we are in church. In church. So it just goes to, to show you that you may be in the right place. At the right time. Listening to the right message. But you do not have the right heart. So you need a little warning. You need a little see. See you have been made well. Meaning you have been pulled out of the state that you were in. But you have been pulled out. But there is a road. There is a pathway. There's a process, 
and without fellowship with God through Jesus Christ, without you walking in the spirit so you can avoid the desires of the flesh, guess what is going to happen? Chances are you're going to be drawn back down. So, this, the, so the, it's, it, it's saying to you today, you have been weighed well. Sin no more, least a worse thing happen to you. He was warned. Many of us are in the same situation today. You are being warned, but you keep doing it. But I got a message for you. Turn your Bibles, Romans 6, we got verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. Some translations say, God forbid. God forbid. How shall we, we who died to sin, live in it any longer? You see, when you come into fellowship with God through Jesus Christ, having been re have repented, having been baptized, when you should have the Holy Spirit residing within you, how can you continue to sin? The scripture says it right here. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Many of us find an excuse just like the layman. Find an excuse, I, 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 you know, because I'm in this situation, you know. No, it, God don't care. You see, the word shall is a legalistic term. What shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid it. God forbid. The onus is on you. Spiritual deformity is real. Many people do not want to accept it. And so many people continue to do what they want to do. You are spiritually deformed if you only declare with your mouth that you believe in God. But you hold grudges within your heart. You are spiritually deformed if you declare with your mouth. That Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior, but you're in church and you're still holding grudges with the person next door. You're spiritually deformed if you declare with your mouth and you went down in water. But once you got out of the water, you're still planning to kill, steal, and destroy. You have to get rid of spiritual deformity. And one of the reasons for that is because our hearts were not pure. We were not in it. Because there was not repentance. And so that's one of the reasons when I say to people, this whole thing about the sinners prior to me, that's a very uh, shaky ground. Because a man can open his mouth and say anything with his hands stick up in the air, repeating after the pastor, but it's not coming from the heart. Because Romans 10, listen to Romans, and I'm giving you Bible. Romans 10. Look at verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ, that the Lord Jesus, confess, confess in your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart. Confession. Confession. But without the belief in your heart, it makes no sense. So you can say all the sinners prior you want to say, Unless there's repentance, unless there's a prior of repentance, doesn't matter. You can have 50,000 people saying a sinner's prior. If there's no repentance, it doesn't matter. It's for naught. And I stand by the word. You confess with your mouth. Paul could have stopped it right there. But he made it clear. And believe in your heart. It goes hand in hand. You believe. You confess. Your heart must be in it. One cannot be faithful to God unless there is true repentance. What? Oh yeah, listen. One cannot be faithful to God unless there is true repentance and it's coming from the heart because the heart has many depths the heart has many depths 
And sometimes we hide things in the depths of our heart. And so when we confess and we believe in our heart, and then the Holy Spirit will have a chance to work within us. And so at that time, we start to develop and we start to manifest the fruits of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5. Look at this. Love. People are in church that we talk love. Joy. People are in church, they always want happiness. There's no joy. <laughs> They have life, but there is no joy. Right? Peace. People are in church without peace. Long suffering means patience. People are in church and they can't be patient. I have to marry that sister now because, he, because she's, she's so nice. Is that the one for you? I have to marry that brother now because he's so handsome. Is he the one? People are in church and there is no kindness. Everything they do is for a show. If they're going to give a donation, they have to have it on social media. Showing that we're giving food to the poor. We're giving money to the poor. We're building the house for the brother. You know he has no house. And you know if it wasn't for this church, you know he would not have had this house. Give yourself a round of applause. Because there's no kindness. No goodness. You know the reason for that? Because no one is good except God. And you cannot be thought goodness unless you belong to him who is the author of goodness. Because goodness is an attribute of God. There is no faithfulness. So they can flip flop today. Hold no allegiance to nobody. There is no gentleness. <laughs> You talk to them, that's how they answer you. Beat you up, be, go home beating up your wife. Beating up your husband. Beating down your child. Beating up everybody. Beating up people on the streets. Because there's no gentleness. There's no self-control. Someone step on your toe and you punch them in their face. Because there's no self-control. You know the reason for that? Because the Holy Spirit cannot work in anything that's dirty. But if you are fellowship with God through Jesus Christ, if you do as the scripture says, if you believe and if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, then the Holy Spirit can start working with you. And uh, what the scripture says, it sums it up as this, against such thing there is no law. And so sin leads to spiritual deformity. How do we break spiritual deformity? By full repentance. How do we repent? By confessing, by believing, by accepting. And you can do that anytime, anywhere, without, without anyone witnessing it. Because God can see, God can hear, and God knows the hearts of all men. In Jesus' name, amen.